excited that you are here to worship with us. Let's sing the hymn this morning. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now?
Say 
sing this out in boldness because we know it is true. Death could not hold you. The bells would be falling. The silence they must not This isn't just someone we sing about. This isn't just someone in a book. No, this is a very real person. His name is Jesus. The mighty name of Jesus, and there's power to it. And he's in this room right now. He's here. I think someone just needs the encouragement this morning. Whatever you came in, carrying on your shoulders, the burdens, when he's in the room, when he's here with you right now, nothing is off the table. Do you believe it this morning? Do you have the faith for this morning? Let's extend our faith a little bit that he can when he's here. He can right now, this morning. So let's just seek after him right now. Would you seek after him in prayer with me? Jesus, Jesus, we just say thank you for being here with us right now, for the promise that you would never leave us in the middle of our storms, in the middle of our valley where we feel like there's no hope, where we don't know where to go. We're scared to take that next step. You're here with us right now. And there's nothing off the table. Anything is possible. And so we get behind you, our Savior, our Lord, our King. Thank you, Jesus. Maybe just speak the name of Jesus over your problems in life. Over your marriage that's not going well. Over that relational hurt. Over that financial burden. Just the name of Jesus has power. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross for setting us free, for what that unlocked just to be here in your presence. We love you. We praise you. In your mighty name, come on, church said together, amen, amen. Hey, can we give God praise this morning? Come on, isn't it good to be in church? So good.
Well, hey, welcome to church. Before you find your seat, you got 20 seconds to give someone a fist bump. And let's encourage each other this morning. We lost that hour of sleep. Say, hey, you get your teeth whitened today. You got a beautiful smile. You're looking good today. That hair's got that perfect comb over. <laughs> so good. I right, thank you, thank you. Well, hey, welcome, welcome, welcome to the bridge. There's, there's just no place like being in the room. And I just got so much gratitude in my heart as I was singing that song. I was just like, man, what God has done for my life and just being in a room, lifting up the name of Jesus with you. And I also just got gratitude for the vision that we have as a church to rebuild, repair, and restore. And we often talk about, like, that means the next generation. That means Southeast Iowa. But also just, that means globally. And just wrap your mind around that. We're making a global impact. And I, you may be aware right now, but we've sent 16 people over to Cambodia. They're there currently as we speak right now on the ground doing the Lord's work. We got a picture of all of them and... I just love the relationship we have with Cambodia. It goes almost two decades long. And we've sent 16 over, but the, our, our campus, we get a treat this morning because we got one in exchange. Uh, missionary partner, Yuka, is in the house this morning. And uh, we've also, I love that they come here, we go there. And one of our spring staffers right now, she was just in Cambodia for nine months. Her name is Olivia. And I just want to bring both of them out just to share a little bit about what's going on in Cambodia. Okay, so can you give a warm welcome to Yuka and Olivia? <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. I, I hope you guys realize, like Cambodia, that's from the other side of the earth. Like, yep. You came a long way. You said to it was the ends of, of the earth and back, yeah. And back. And you said it was kind of a nightmare this time. Can you explain a little bit about your travels? So I left on Wednesday, which is Tuesday, your time. And then I arrived yesterday, Friday. Pastor Marty picked me up. So it was like four days of travel. 96 hours. Yeah, yeah. So I think I just the layover in LAX, which is like 15 hours, which is brutal, yeah. In an airport that long, I'm sure the shower afterwards felt so yeah. good. <laughs> and a real bath felt so good. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so you're just a little tired, right? A tiny bit. <laughs> well, it is, it's such an honor to have you here, Yuka. And I've, got, I've gotten to know you as, as a leader and a brother in Christ for a while. And I wish that everyone here could know you personally. But you and Marty go way back, right? Yeah, yeah totally. Oh, 13 years ago, probably. Yeah. Something like that. I think we even have a picture of the first time you guys were teaching together. Look at that throwback. <laughs> yeah, that's Marty and me in the back, a bit more younger and more handsome. Man, probably. look at that, yeah. <laughs> and is there anyone else special in this picture? So, um, a little girl over there. She's not very little. Um, <laughs> uh, over there next to Cable, you know Cable, who she is. Um, that's my wife, Dim. In the we, blue? In the blue Yeah, there? in the blue over there. Now, were you dating then? No, not yet. So. Not yet. And then later on, we did. And, uh, here you <laughs> and you got kids, too. You got three daughters. Three daughters, four and a half, two and a half, and ten months. So we're busy. Just a little bit <laughs> <Just> busy. <laughs> That's so sweet. And so this school, you guys are currently running this. Do you want to give us a little bit of the heart behind it? So DTS is like, um, it stands for Discipleship Training School, which is a six-month school, three weeks of lecture phase, and three months of outreach, which is we learn about hearing God's voice, nature and character of God, lordship, you know, cost of discipleship, which is like, you know, you know, what to, you know, wait, what do you need to willing to lay down to follow Jesus? And then that's, that we actually transformed my life. I was like, yeah, six months of my life. And now it's 14 years. Um, so, and, and, and yeah, you learn about God and not just going to keep it for yourself. You're going to go out and preach and share and your life transform in the process. So. And so the current school going on, what are some of the outreach locations that you guys are sending teams to? So normally we send people to around Cambodia, which is now that we have 13 locations of 25 provinces, so over halfway. And after that, they're going to go to a different country. And then I believe that this year they're going to send a team to Laos, which is one of the top 10 unreached nations, maybe still is. And Mongolia, which is the gospel is... The good news is the great news is why they're willing to go to the hardest places. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. So, pre-COVID, you weren't in Cambodia. Do you want to share where you were at? So, most of my time in serving with YWAM, you know who we are. And uh, uh, most of my time in, in Batamang, Cambodia, about two and a half years, I was in Laos. 
serving and going there as undercover missionary because they don't expect Cambodian to be, you know, Christian, be Buddhist nation, but little did they know, you know, and <laughs> just go there and try to blend in and learn the language, share the gospel, and then, but when, when I stand up and like, hmm, you're a bit too tall for a loud person, so, and then, uh, yeah, serving, gospel, uh, serving God there and preach the gospel in, in a wise way, in a cautious way, because they, they send people to watch us, to watch us, what are we doing, because like, what's going on, what are you, what are you guys doing, and, but the gospel is unstoppable. We're still able to preach and share when people ask us questions. We share about like why we do, what we're doing there. And yeah, God can open doors. Even the door is always shut by people, but God can open it. That's amazing. And now you're back in Cambodia and you are like the base director of the base, which is like top guy. So it's such an honor to have you get here with us. Do you want to share a quick um, like snippet of the heart behind the base? So we were called to be a regional hub, a resource hub, where people come in and get sent out. And uh, Cambodia, we pray and we believe it's no longer just a mission field, but a sending field. We begin to send Cambodian missionaries to Laos, to China, to, to Myanmar. We be believe that God has he, he, he's been tran he's transformed the people. And we know that we're not just a mission field anymore, but it's a place where God's going to send people to the end of the year. I pray in my lifetime. And within this 30, 40 years, I will see Cambodian go to the ends of the earth from Cambodia. I believe that God's going to raise up a mission movement out of Asia, from the east to the west. And we're now we're going to work together, not just like long, longer, just the west to the east, but together we reach the world together, to fulfill the Great Commission together. In my lifetime, I pray that it's such an exciting time to be alive, to see the nation to come to know the Lord. And from all color, from all languages, go into all the world, to all and every to the least, the last, and the lost. That's, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. And do you want to share just a little piece of what the bridge team, maybe we could even pull the picture back up, of what the bridge team is doing in Cambodia right now? So typically every day we have about four or five people coming to our campus every single day. We're just like always busy. And then I believe that they're going to do some medical clinic on the campus, which is hundreds of people will come and get the health check. And after that, we're going to give them the message of eternal life. And maybe some of them will come, you know, come to know the Lord, get some healing, not just by medicine, but by prayer. And I think it's going to be amazing because they're going to hang out and spend time serving, like, uh, young people for coming for our, our youth development center, which is like English school, and kids like coming into a campus to play soccer and they're going to be able to serve and, and spend time just to be like Jesus to, to all these people who, you know, from really rough background and difficult families and all that. I think just they're going to be such a huge blessing right now to our, to our community in, in bottom ball. That's well, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you endured the 96 hours of the airport because it, it really is such an honor to have you with us this morning. Before you go, is there, is there anything you want to share with the Bridge Church this morning? So this is always in my heart. I mean, 101 years ago, the American missionary came to Cambodia for the first time. And last year, we celebrated 100 years of the gospel. In Cambodia, 30,000 Cambodian Christians coming together, worshiping Jesus in public. We say 10, 15 years ago, that would not be as, like, it, was, it wouldn't happen. People would come and shut us down. But that happened last year. And Olivia was there, which is crazy. <laughs> and, then, and, and the government came to us and like, you guys should do this more. I said, yes, please, yeah, let us do it more. So it's just amazing, the 100 years. And then, then I just thank you, America, American churches, sending amazing missionaries who say yes, all in and all of it. The gospel is so good, they, they're willing to go. Translating Bible for decades. They spent decades because translation back then was so slow. And then, like, the Bible came to completion probably three or four decades and they'd have one book to study at a time finished. Had to wait for several years to study another book because the translation takes forever. But because they are obedience, we are where we are today. Thank you for your obedience. And I believe that God's not done in America. He's going to do so much more. Last year in February in Asbury University in Kentucky, the, the, the revival was taking place. That people flew around the world just to go and see it. God's not done. And I believe that God's going to do so much more. You guys. He's doing it again. 
And I pray for America. I pray for you guys that you continue to say yes to Jesus. To stand up and say, God, here I am. I'll go. I'll do this. Whether, whether, whether it's in the city or whether in this state or a different state or different nation, different part of the world. I will say yes because you are worthy. I just pray. I just pray. Uh, this is my heart. And, and I thank you guys. I thank you, American churches, too, and especially this church, partnering with us for the last 13 years. Thank you for your obedience. Thank you for your generosity, for your love, for the nations. And I just, can I just pray for you guys really quick? Is it okay? And can you, like, bow our head together next to your partner? Uh, God, just praise you, God, for your faithfulness, for your love for the nation that you manifested through this church. And I pray that, God, that you continue to move, God. That we, we pray for another revival, another mission moving out of America. We can declare that you are faithful Throughout generations, throughout generations, hundreds of years, thousands of years, we declare that over America right now and over this church that you will raise up missionaries to say yes, to rise up and say, here I'm, here am I, God, send me. And I pray, I pray, God, that we will see you in a greater way, greater level, revelation of who you are and that we will say yes before you even ask. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for this amazing church. Praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, can we give it up for Yuka coming all the way from Cambodia? So good. Thank you. Thank you. Church, we're, we're on the move. Jesus said, go make disciples, and we're, we're doing it. I just want to thank you for your generosity that has allowed us to do things like this. Well, hey, today is going to look a little bit differently because uh, we, we came across this message and in this series called The Week That Changed the World. And it just captivated us. We watched the message and we're like, that is so good. We couldn't say it better. So we just wanted to share this with you. And we reached out to the pastor that preached this. He's a friend of ours. And we said, can we show it? And he said, yes, I would love if you did. Can I share some words before the message? And so this is Pastor Tim Lucas. Let's check it out. Hey, my name is Tim Lucas. I serve as lead pastor of Liquid Church in New Jersey on the East Coast. And I want to send a big shout out to Pastor Marty and the entire family at Bridge Church. You know, Pastor Marty is a close friend. And let me tell you, you have a world-class pastor who loves you guys. It has been a joy for us to hear about all the incredible things God is doing in the great state of Iowa through your church, we have heard all the way out here on the East Coast about lives being changed by Jesus, addictions broken, marriages, families restored all across your region through the ministry at Bridge. You know, recently, Pastor Marty asked me if he could share a message that I gave last spring from our series we called Passion, in which we walked through the events of Passion Week, the week that changed the world. In fact, that's their tagline from the series. That's the title of your current series, The Week That Changed the World. It really did. So today, you're going to see a message that I taught at Liquid Church uh, that was right at the start of that week, a day we refer to as Palm Sunday. I really hope it encourages you, Bridge Church. Please know that we love you guys, and you have thousands of brothers and sisters in Christ who are cheering you on from the East Coast. So may God bless y'all in this Easter season. Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Tim. Welcome to Liquid. Can we give a big welcome to our live locations? <laughs> Joining us today, Passaic, Somerset, Middlesex, Princeton. You guys know who you are, man. Great to have you with us. We're in the season of Lent, these 40 days leading up to Easter. And so we're starting this brand new small group series today called Passion, the Week that Changed the World. And it's really all about Holy Week. That is the final week of Jesus's life. And um, if you don't know, Holy Week is considered the most sacred seven days in Christianity. Um, so let's begin this way by just acknowledging this reality. Um, not all weeks are created equal, are they? Um, there's just like some weeks in your life that just kind of stand apart from all the others because the events that happen to you in that week change everything. A couple Sundays ago, I was talking to a guy in, uh, at one of our campuses who told me, uh, he said, Tim, I woke up actually on a Monday morning. I was feeling like super tired. I just couldn't even get, seem to get myself out of bed. He said, I kind of felt sick. So my wife came in. She said, I looked pale. She thought maybe I had a cold. So she calls a doctor and he says, I went in to see my PCP that afternoon and my blood pressure was way out of whack. And so on Tuesday, we went to my cardiologist who took an EKG and an echocardiogram and he came back and said, 
three of your arteries are almost 100% blocked. Cancel your plans. You need to have surgery today. Now, my friend was shocked, and he said, well, okay, I got a lot of stuff going on today. Can we schedule it for next week? And the doctor said, if you don't go to the hospital right now, you may not be here tomorrow. So suddenly, what, what he thought was just a normal week, normal meetings and chores, I'm going to get the oil changed in the car. No, 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 no. <laughs> You're having heart surgery this afternoon. Suddenly, this week changes everything. It's not just the dramatic stuff. It's, it's the, the week with the second or third job interview. Because you're like, man, if this opportunity opens up, this could be a game changer for you. So you're called back for the second interview on Tuesday. The third interview is on Wednesday. And suddenly, this is not an ordinary week. This is the week that could literally change everything, right? Now, looking out at some of you, I see some parents here. Um, For some of you, there was a week when you came home from the hospital with a little baby in your arms. And it was your first child and a whole lot of things changed on that day, right? In fact, your whole life got flipped upside down. You remember when you used to sleep? Remember that? Yeah. 18 years, you'll sleep again. Don't worry. That, that first child, that little boy, that little girl arrived in your world. Well, that week just changed everything, didn't it? See, not all weeks are created equal. Some stand out. And because of events that you didn't expect or you could not imagine, the whole world changed around you. And this was true for Jesus as well. This series we're doing in the weeks leading up to Easter is focused on Holy Week. If you think of it this way, it's the final week, Monday through Friday, Sunday through Friday, of Jesus' life. And it takes place in Jerusalem. That's the the capital city there in Israel. Some of you will visit with me in May. Um, That's Jerusalem. And think about it this way. Jesus will enter Jerusalem on a Sunday, and Jesus will be executed on a Friday. Uh, That's a week that changed the world. And so for the next five weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to actually follow in the footsteps of our Savior. We're going to join Jesus on this journey into Jerusalem and walk through the events of Holy Week. And we'll experience what's called his passion. Now, Americans often think passion means, you know, like, oh, romantic love. No, passion biblically means suffering born out of love for you, for me. And our small groups, we're going to be walking through the Gospel of Mark. Because um, if you're unfamiliar with how the Bible is organized, essentially there are four different biographies of Jesus in your Bible. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, anybody? John. And all four biographies record the historical events of Jesus' final week. Now today we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark. And uh, if you started at chapter 1 of Mark, it's interesting, just to give you context. If you read the first, I love Mark because it's like (laughs) action-packed. If you read the first 10 chapters of Mark, you'll be out of breath. This is like for Enneagram 3s, okay? This is the most action-oriented gospel or biography because it's kind of paced like a whirlwind. Like when you read Mark, it's like suddenly, you know, Jesus heals somebody, then he jumps in a boat, then he goes across a lake, then he feeds some people, he gets back in the boat, he casts out a demon, he does another miracle, picks a fight with the Pharisees, back in the boat, across the lake, it's like, woof! (laughs) It's like, what man? It's like one thing after another, and you get this sense that you're driving through Jesus' life at 90 miles an hour. Now watch this, lean in. That's chapters 1 through 10. But when you get to chapter 11, everything just slows down. (laughs) It's like, have you ever been like in the fast lane of the Garden State Parkway? (laughs) And yeah, I saw you sinners. (laughs) And then you like take an off-ramp at an exit, and it's like, it's like hit the brakes. Suddenly you're going like 15 miles an hour on a single lane country road and the pace slows down in Jesus' final week. In fact, take a look at this. In Mark's gospel, let me show you how it looks. The first 10 chapters cover three years of Jesus' life and ministry at this whirlwind pace, but the next and final six chapters are devoted to eight days. So understand the last week of Jesus' life is totally disproportionate to the amount of ink that it receives. Three years in 10 chapters, eight days in the last six. It's like everything just slows down, and I think we're supposed to slow down with it. I think, I think the Lord meant us to kind of really absorb this and let it shape us and slow down and walk with Jesus in the final week of his life. So understand something. The, G, uh, the disciples walked with Jesus into Jerusalem, And in some sense, I think God is inviting you and me to walk with them, to walk together along with Jesus, 
along with your small group, day by day, event by event, through his passion, the week that changed the world. So today, I'm excited because I just want to kind of set up this series by looking at what happened on Sunday. We're going to circle that in the calendar. This is the first day of his final week when Jesus made what's called his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Okay, next week, we're going to look at Jesus stir up trouble in the temple. He was a troublemaker. Uh, the week after, we'll join Jesus for a quiet dinner with friends in this, this upper room. And we're going to show you some of these places historically. Um, you'll see his betrayal in a garden. We'll see him carry a cross um, on Friday to Golgotha. And then we'll arrive, praise God, in an empty tomb on Easter Sunday. Sound good? All right, let's walk together. Let's join Jesus on Sunday. And this is a special Sunday that has come to be known in the Christian calendar as Palm Sunday. Can you say that with me? Palm Sunday. Now, to help get you in the mood, we're going to pass out some palm fronds today. So all our campuses, can ushers come on down, pass out the palms. Go ahead, take one down, pass it around. 99 palms on the bit. No, no, just (laughs) pass out a palm. Take one, pass it down. One only, okay? Once you get it, shake it if you got it. Give me a little shake. Come on, a little shake, 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 shake. Okay, there you go. They're coming from the back too. Just hurry up, pass them down. And uh, just once you got your palm, wave your palm in the air, wave it all around like you just don't care, all right? Everyone say, happy Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. All right? Now, this is not officially Palm Sunday, but I'm going to take you through this beginning in Mark chapter 10, okay? You're going to get to participate. We're going to be there like it was happening to us, okay? Starting at verse 32, here's what the Word of God says. It says, They were on their way up to, what's the name of the city? Everyone together? Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Isn't that interesting? Half the people were astonished, like, oh, I can't wait. And half were afraid, what's going to happen? Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. Now, this is really important. Jesus, understand, was not caught by surprise. As a son of God, he's omniscient. He knew exactly what was about to happen to him this week. Three times, in fact, he says to the disciples, hey, we're going to Jerusalem to suffer and die, which is sort of ironic because you see the word Jerusalem, see the word Salem in it, it's where you get the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. So Jerusalem translates to city of peace but it was anything but peaceful for Jesus. In fact, this is the third time Jesus predicted his death to his disciples. Verse 33 says this, we're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and let me be clear. The son of man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And here's what they're gonna do. They will condemn me to death. He'll hand me over to the Gentiles who will mock me, spit on me, flog me, and kill me. And three days later, I will rise. Who's with me? (laughs) Like, Like you think this is pretty clear, but the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was saying. And they're like, wait, what? Like, Peter, do you get this? No, I don't understand. Andrew, do you know? Maybe it's a parable. I don't know. They, who could blame them? With every miracle that Jesus performed, he's becoming a celebrity. Understand, He had just raised Lazarus from the dead. So word is spreading. He's becoming popular with people. Everyone's like, I think he might be the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah. This is the promised king, the savior that Israel had been waiting hundreds of years for. So the disciples assume we're going to Jerusalem, man, for a coronation. We are going to roll into the capital city. We're going to take this thing over. We got the people behind us. The public is going crazy and the religious leaders are afraid and they better be because Jesus is flexing. He's growing in power and popularity. So they're like, yeah, let's go to Jerusalem. And and Jesus is like, wait, 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 guys, 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 wait, slow down, time out. What? I'm going there to suffer and die. They're gonna arrest me, condemn and torture me and then murder me. But peace, I tell you, three days later, I will rise. And they just like looked at Jesus blankly like, what? What? Why are you such a downer, man? (laughs) Don't you see, man? You're like blowing up. You got a lot of followers on social media. What? You're going to be crowned king, Jesus. 
don't be a downer. This is going to be the high point of our ministry together. I've told you, there's a reason they're called the disciples, right? Like, duh, you just don't get it. Even though Jesus predicted his death and resurrection three times, they still didn't understand. And maybe you don't understand yet either. Maybe like you're here today and you're still trying to figure out, you're coming back to church or, you know, you believe in Jesus. I don't really like religion. I think he was a really good teacher, a good model. Or is he a savior? Is he a, a Lord? Understand, this was part of God's plan from the very beginning. That God the Father would send his only son to our world to love and heal broken lives. But first, Jesus said, I'm going to have to be broken. I'm going to have to be rejected, condemned, killed on a cross in our place to pay for our sins. So let me set the scene for you. Are you ready? Imagine it's Sunday morning. It's Palm Sunday in Jerusalem. And the reason everyone's excited is because Passover is about to start. You guys know what Passover is? Woo! Passover, man. It's like the 4th of July, okay, in Israel. It's this week-long religious festival for Jewish people where they celebrate Israel's most important story, how God miraculously delivered the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. And so at Passover, understand, it was like a monster truck jam, okay? Everybody drove in on their camels and everything. You know, all the Jews from around the Roman world, not just Israel, around the world would come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Exodus, so Jerusalem is packed. People have foam fingers, okay? More than 200,000 pilgrims pour into this little city. So it's like the Super Bowl. And Mark 11, verse 1 says this. As Jesus of the 12 approached Jerusalem and came to the what? The Mount of Olives. Now, again, let me pause here to take you to the Mount of Olives. I'm going to show you this for real, okay? In May, we have about 150 of us uh, pilgrims who are going to the Holy Land. And we're going to see these places in person, both, just let you know, because people are like, did I miss that? Both tours of Israel are sold out, but don't worry, we will go back again, okay? We'll go back again. But today, I was like, I want to show everybody, I want to take you on a virtual tour. I want to show you exactly what Jesus saw. As Jesus and his disciples climbed to the top of the Mount of Olives, this is what they would have seen. It's a mountain ridge to the east, right outside of Jerusalem. It gives a stunning panoramic view of the city, the heart of Israel. You see the glittering gold dome of the rock? That's the original site of the Jewish temple. Today, there's a mosque at the top, and it is actually a holy site for Muslims and Jews. But you'd see the ruins of David's tower in Jerusalem, and everything's built from golden limestone. Isn't it beautiful? So when the sun hits, it, it's like the city gets this golden glow. And you can see there, people are being drawn to the western wall of the temple in the old city where they pray. And then when night falls, Jerusalem just kind of lights up. It's buzzing with pilgrims from all over the world. And Mark says, as they approach Jerusalem, and came to the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, I want you to go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a what? A colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. I want you to untie it and bring it here to me. And this is kind of a head scratcher request. Like this is like kind of odd. Jesus is like, I want you to bring me a young donkey to ride up into the city, all right? And again, his disciples are like, wait, what? All through the Gospels, Jesus walked everywhere he went. There is no historical record of him ever taking an Uber. He, he, didn't, he didn't drive a Vespa from Galilee down to Jerusalem. In fact, Jesus walked 90 miles from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. And he says, but now I want you to bring me a donkey to ride a mile, maybe a half mile from the temple. That's where he is. It's kind of like, why did he do that? Very calculated request. Jesus is trying to make a point. He wants to make an illustration. He's about to show the people the kind of king that he is. See, 500 years before Christ was born, the prophet Zechariah made a prediction. He made a promise to the Jews in the Old Testament. Zechariah 9, verse 9, prophesied this. Shout in triumph, O people in Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, yet he is what? He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. Now, this prophecy is over 500 years old, but everybody in Jerusalem would have known this prophecy. Since the age of eight, little boys memorized these verses that predicted the future moment that this Jewish Messiah, this, this new king would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey to save his people. 
So Jesus, understand, it's not like, I don't really have a way to get there. Let me get a donkey. He's intentionally sending a signal. I am the long-awaited king you've been waiting your whole life for. He's publicly declaring, I'm the Messiah. I'm the savior. But notice something. Zechariah says, your king's coming to you. He's righteous. He's victorious. Yet he's humble riding on a donkey. So you have to ask, what kind of king is Jesus? And the donkey tells us he is royalty and humility rolled up in one. See, in the first century, victorious kings typically entered a city, not on a gray donkey, but on a white war horse. If you had conquered another enemy, you came in a white stallion pulled by golden chariots, showing your people your military muscle. You want to show off, right? You you guys even get this. Again, think of the royal wedding of Prince Harry and Meghan. Now, I know everybody has had about enough of Harry and Meghan at this point. Just want to acknowledge that. Okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. But we all watched, right, as they rode through the streets of London in this, look at this royal carriage. They have a, a team of white stallions pulling them. They're surrounded by Her Majesty's soldiers, They're proudly parading through London, clop, 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 to all these cheering crowds. Why? Because that's how royalty enters a capital. (laughs) Flaunt it if you got it. This is how you announce your power. This is how you show off your wealth. It's how you flaunt your prestige, not Jesus. He says, my kingdom is not about power. It's not about wealth. It's not about prestige. Lean in. It's about humility and peace and service. And so he rides this humble donkey to show he is a servant king and he has come to serve his people. Catch this, by the way, young people. Young people right now is kind of like, I want to be an influencer. I want to, listen to me. You don't need power, fame, or money to change the world. In fact, humility has a power all its own. It says When they brought the colt to Jesus, they threw their cloaks over it. He sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread what? Spread branches they had cut in the fields. And these would be like the palm fronds you're holding, okay? Everyone wave your palm branches. Go ahead, wave your palm branches. Why palm branches? And it's interesting. Here's why. Because in the ancient world, that was the tradition of how you welcome home a victorious king or conqueror. If you had a war hero coming to the city, we get the palm branches out. And watch this. As the king rode into the city, here's what the peasants would do. They would take the palm branches. Here he comes. Here he comes on his white stallion, on his horse. Lay down the palm branches. It was their way of rolling out the red carpet. You get it? So imagine this. Jesus is riding this donkey. And they're like, well, it's not a horse. But okay, down the Mount of Olives. And Mark, Mark says, those who went ahead and those who followed behind shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everyone say Hosanna. Hosanna. It literally means save us, King Hosanna. So the Jewish people are welcoming Jesus as their savior. And they're like, here's his royal procession. Here he comes. Long live the king. They actually say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the what? Highest heaven. Everyone go like this. Long live the king. Long live the king. Hosanna. Can, can you picture this? Can you, can you enter, see yourself in this crowd? When we visit Jerusalem in May, we're going to visit the Mount of Olives, and I'm going to walk you down the exact road that Jesus walked into Jerusalem. Every year, Christians from all over the world walk down this road on Palm Sunday. And you can see them there. They're actually waving palms and they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Again, say Hosanna. Hosanna, long live the king, the savior's here. And they were so excited because it's like, this is a victory parade. Finally, Jesus is going to deliver us from the rotten Romans. Because remember, Jerusalem, they were an occupied people. Rome was there oppressing the people. And so everyone's like, so excited. The disciples like, Peter's like, well, this is going to be amazing. Wait, Jesus, what? First the donkey, now this. Why is Jesus crying? Stop and imagine for a minute you're a disciple. People are shouting for joy. They're celebrating as the Savior rides in. And so you jog up to Jesus. And you're like, Jesus, isn't this awesome? Wait, what? 
and you look at Jesus' face, and he's actually weeping. Hot tears are running down his face. And and you're confused. You're like, Jesus, why, why are you crying? This is your coronation. Luke describes it in his biography this way. He says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he what? He wept over it. He said, if you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. That word for weeping there is not the gentle tears of a baby like, oh, let me tap my eyes. It actually means uncontrollable sobbing, sorrow. Jesus is weeping as he's coming in on this donkey and and you're confused. Everyone else is excited. Why is the king crying? Because he knew. A lot can change in a week. In just five days, this same crowd now shouting Hosanna will shout, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Kill him. Again, Jesus knew the future, and he also knew the hearts of men. That crowds can be fickle, can't they? In the moment those people realized Jesus wasn't bringing, listen to me, the political victory, the military revolution they wanted, they would reject him. They'd reject his message of, of, here's my message. I want you to love your enemies. What? No, 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 no. They'd reject his command to pray for those who persecute you. What? Lay down your life. Jesus is not this, he's not a politician. He is not a conquering king who fits all of our expectations. He is a prince of peace who models a very different way, a way of self-sacrifice. See, the people want the way of the sword. You want a military leader who's going to flex and liberate you from the rotten Romans. They want a, you know what they want? They want to make Jerusalem great again. That's not a political statement. I'm just saying, that's what they thought. We, this, this country's going to hell in a handbasket, get the Romans out. We're going to set up a kingdom here. Jesus knew Jerusalem's future too. He could look and see in 35 years that the Romans would actually send in 60,000 soldiers storm the city, and they would slaughter one million Jewish people. The streets would run red with blood. And then the Romans would tear down the temple brick by brick, stone by stone. And that's exactly what happened in the year 70 AD. In Jerusalem, I want to show you the actual street that Jesus rode in on, and today the ruins of the Jewish temple. Hey guys, I'm here in Jerusalem. I want to show you the road that Jesus walked into the city. Take a look right here. This is the road we know Jesus came in on when he came into Jerusalem going to the temple. This is the temple. This is the western wall of the temple. And what's incredible is you can still see the ruins from when the Romans destroyed it. Take a look. They just excavated these. These are the rocks. They're literally in the same place from when the Romans sacked Jerusalem, poured it over the wall into rubble, into ruins and saying, don't ever mess with Rome. But remember what Jesus said? Tear down this temple and in three days, I will rebuild it. I'll rise again. Of course, he wasn't speaking about the literal temple, but he is the ultimate temple. And you and I are now the temple of God filled with the Holy Spirit. Welcome to Jerusalem. Do you understand why Jesus was crying? Because he foresaw two temples about to be torn down. In 35 years, a Jewish temple would be ripped down by the Romans. But in seven days, the span of a single week, he said, my temple, my body is going to be torn to pieces. So Jesus is weeping for two reasons. He sees Jerusalem's destruction and his coming crucifixion. So understand, Palm Sunday was a day of celebration for us, but a day of bittersweet sorrow for Jesus. It began this week that would change his world and our world. It's a week that began with celebration, but it ends with a king dying on a cross for sins he didn't commit. So the question is like, how, how can this turn into this in a span of seven days? A lot can happen in a week. 
how do you go from a coronation to a crucifixion in seven days? See, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, again, place yourself, maybe you're in the crowd, you're waving, Team Jesus! Not everybody was thrilled. In fact, the Pharisees were threatened, the religious leaders, because Jesus did something very politically incorrect. He publicly called out their hypocrisy. He saw all the priests, and the, the pastors, and the religious leaders, and he, he, he said, you know, you, you guys, how do I put this? You snakes! You brood of vipers. He's like, you're a nest of snakes. <laughs> you hypocrites, you actors. You take advantage of the people, you cozy up to Rome, and the Pharisees were offended. And then they got jealous because now their followers are unfriending them and they're going to follow Jesus. And so by Tuesday, by Tuesday, this is what Mark writes. He says, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were what? They were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly because they're cowards and kill him unjustly. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. They didn't want to risk a public riot Passover because otherwise Rome may come then crack down and take away their power. Pause. Isn't it amazing? Toxic politics and religion were part of the ancient world too. They're jealous of Jesus's growing popularity and power. And so they come up with this plan we're going to falsely accuse Jesus. We're going to secretly arrest him. And watch this. It sets in motion, as we will see on Thursday. They will pay one of his followers named Judas 30 pieces of silver to turn Jesus over. You can see it in this ancient mosaic. They will arrest Jesus in Gethsemane with swords, clubs, and torches. And then, watch this. In the wee hours of Friday morning, Jesus, the king, is condemned as a criminal. He will be taken in a trumped-up trial that takes place very early morning hours, pass along to Pilate, that's who you see in this painting, the Roman governor. Pilate sends Jesus back to King Herod, who sends him back to Pilate, he's like a hot potato. No one knows what to do with Jesus because they know the charges against him are made up. And two, they know he's innocent. His only crime, I'm gonna speak God's truth and make the Pharisees jealous. Pilate's amazing, by the way, he, is a, he, is a, he's a, he would get elected today for sure. He is a politician's politician. He knew how to compromise, cave to the crowds. And with the city packed with pilgrims, he's like, I don't want to start trouble. I don't want to riot on my hands. So Pilate actually caves to political pressure. He sentences Jesus to death. Watch this. Church and state together deliver the sentence, death by crucifixion. You understand? Jesus' journey to Jerusalem begins with a parade on Palm Sunday and ends with his crucifixion on Good Friday from this to this. Like I said, a lot can happen in a week. What a way to kick off this series from here till Easter. So much power in that one sentence, the week that changed the world. And my hope is that that message spoke to you. For me, it was just a reminder. As Pastor Tim was saying, like a, a lot of the gospel of Mark is fast, 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 but then there's a slowdown to cover the last eight days, and I think for me, my, my takeaway is like, how, how can I slow down from here till Easter? And we, I love that we gave a, a palm branch to you, just to, maybe a, a reminder as you go home, just to slow down and welcome them into your life, and I just want to give you two applications, two things that you can do. One is a connect group, and a connect group is just, you just listen to the sermon, which you've done, and then you talk about it with other people, and I think it's a way to slow down. I think there's always excuses. I don't have time for it, but could you benefit from talking about the week that changed the world with other people? If that's your next step, you can head to Next Steps. You'll see it in the lobby on your way out. They'll get you. There's different days of the week. We offer a lot of them. They'll find the right one for you, and the other one is as Jesus illustrated what it looks like to be humble. He came in on a donkey. He came not to be served, but to serve. And we embody that the way he modeled. We serve with joy is how we say it here at the bridge. And we've just noticed there's, with a big snowstorm, there's a lot of branches around. And usually we have a big serve day in the summer, but we see because of need, we're, hey, we're actually, we wrote down all the things that we could do and the phone calls we've gotten. We're like, we have enough for at least over a hundred people to serve. And so you're gonna hear 
more about this. It's just a tease, but if you're like, hey, I don't need more, I'm in, you can sign up on the Bridge website or uh, out at Next Steps, April 6th, serve day. Uh, so, hey, can you stand with me? I'm going to pray a blessing. Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the truth of Palm Sunday. Lord, we, we praise you as our, our King, but also our Savior. So God, I pray that your, your hope would continue to pull us forward. That your blessing, your favor would go before us. So we'd be a light in your kingdom in, you, in this world. We love you, Jesus. We pray this in your mighty name.